before I begin a bit of a note and terminology, so EDI, which you're going to hear me say a few times, that stands for equity, diversity and inclusion. Now, diversity is simply the mix of visible and invisible difference. That is what diversity is. Diversity or diverse isn't what something other people are. Everyone is part of diversity. Inclusion is the culture where all value is, uh, all difference is valued, respected and acknowledged. So diversity is the mix and inclusion is the culture. Equity is about equality of access, making up for historic imbalance and in addressing individual needs. So uh, where equality is about everyone getting the same, that's fine if everyone is at the same start point, but we know that that isn't the case in reality. So equity is about making up for that. Also, if you've heard me do a talk similar to this one before, I hope that you'll find some new reflections and points to consider in it. If not, if this is your first time listening to me speak, I hope you'll understand that it's in my nature to use these occasions to provoke questions, rethinking and an opportunity for what I call, and others call a, a cognitive evolution. So I'm going to talk to you for about uh, 25 to 30 minutes. Um, I'm only going to be sharing one slide towards the end of the talk and I'll open up uh, for any questions after that. Now, I'm not an architect, so I asked an architecture trained colleague to summarise for me the purpose, as she saw it, of architecture. And what she then shared with me was this little stream of consciousness, but I deemed her words to be pure poetry. So I'm going to share them with you now. Great architecture is uplifting, inspiring delightful, transformative. It's a work of art where you can feel the quality and depth of thinking in every tiny detail, from the swing of a door to the position of a window, its place in a city or landscape, its impact on the climate or neighborhood. Architects are amazing problem solvers, marriage counsellors, and mediators. Architects are artists. Hearing that, I was also reminded of Sir David Ajay's words when receiving the gold medal last year, whose work I summarised in three words, function, beauty, community. It's been made clear to me that I still need to answer the question, why, why am I here? Why does my job exist? Why do we need to be thinking about diversity and inclusion in architecture? It's my opinion that architecture and the REBA cannot be great if it doesn't. We may think we are, but that's from the corner of our own minds and experiences. When we consider the swing of a door, or the position of a window? Is it only functional, beautiful, and encompassing for you and those like you, or for many? When we place in the city, are we involving the voices of the communities? When we try to problem solve, are we approaching these problems from a true mix of perspectives to arrive at truly innovative solutions? I'm here because there are people who can bring greatness to this profession and we're not actually letting them in. I'm here because those who do get in aren't always given a strong enough voice. I'm here because architecture has greater potential, which together we can fulfill. The issues we face in EDI in the workplace, in architectural workplaces, are societal. They're not specific to any individual or sector, but it's beholden upon each one of us to tackle it. As Steve Grunert and Todd Whitaker say in their book, School Culture Rewired, the culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate. 
Thus, I must believe, conversely, the culture of any organization can be shaped by the best behaviors leaders are willing to demonstrate. So who am I? Who am I to be telling you all of this? As you know, my name is Marsha Ramroop, and I've not always been an EDI specialist. For 30 years, I pursued a career in radio and journalism, and I worked at the BBC on and off for 25 years and chose to leave that career to push forward with my specific inclusion work. And some people have asked me, how do you move from journalism to inclusion? And to be honest, it hasn't been that big of a leap, uh, it, given the way that I approached my work. I've always been happiest and most purposeful when working directly with different communities, going into their space and asking them, what are their stories? What do they want to say? And getting them to tell those stories in the way they want to, and then sharing those stories online and on the radio. So I instigated, I facilitated media literacy projects and provided people with the skills and the equipment to do this. And I lived by, and I still do, the personal work motto of giving the unheard voice a place to speak. And as I went through my career, most of the times I tried to do this, I wasn't supported and I was often met with resilience, resistance rather, despite my own resilience. And even as I excelled as a manager and as a leader, those around me, they felt they had to take me down. So I found that central efforts to promote diversity and inclusion were deeply flawed. We were figuratively bashing people over the head and, and saying, you need to get more black people on the radio. You need to get more women on TV. You need to get them into news, get them into programs. And production staff would know when monitoring was coming round and then rush around, digging around uh, to get a variety of contributors and then forget about them the rest of the time. There's clearly an absence as to how to do EDI better. And in trying to find an answer, that's when I discovered CQ Cultural Intelligence. And I set up my own consultancy in strategic inclusion called Unheard Voice. CQ is the missing link, the framework of behaviours necessary to move people from knowing why they want to be better at EDI to actual successful, tangible outcomes. And I'll be explaining more about that shortly. But I kept up with my radio work because as I used to say, radio is what I want to do, inclusion is what I need to do. And I developed my own strategic tool underpinned with CQ to help bring about inclusive change. And I kept on with my job at the BBC. I'd already chosen to leave the BBC and concentrate on my own consultancy work when the job came up with the RIBA and I went for it, leaving behind my Korean radio uh, and my own business, which had only ever really been a vehicle for me to do the work. Because whenever as a consultant, I was asked for the business case for EDI, a part of me died. I have to sell the idea that humans deserve and equality of access to opportunity. This business case for why I should exist equally alongside others. At least now I feel that I've got greater influence with it than I ever did on my own. You know, Toni Morrison says the function, the very serious function of racism is as a distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language, uh, you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact uh, that it is. Somebody says you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says you have no kingdom, so you dredge that up. None of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. And I've discovered Tony Morrison's quote there, to be 100% true. So now I spend my time trying to lift the veil on racism and other forms of discrimination so the scale can fall from people's eyes and we can tackle its function. So what's stopping you from using your existing skills, your knowledge, your abilities to be inclusive architects driving change? What causes discrimination and underrepresentation?
is how to tackle discrimination uh, in architecture, something that can be taught. Does architecture have a future if in our fast evolving demography, we're struggling to future proof? These philosophical, even existential questions are ones we must start thinking about if we're to be at effective at inclusion in architecture as we need to be. To do anything else is to firefight at the edges of this issue and to manage the symptoms, not eradicate the cause. To do anything else is to let down the profession that you love. So we come back to the question, what is it that stops us from doing this better? What are the roots of discrimination? And when we peel back the layers of this question, we find an answer. Our bias. We have 11 million pieces of information going into our brain at any given moment and the conscious capacity to process just 40. The shortcutting of information is a human biological need and it's the root of bias creation. Now, unconscious bias awareness workshops have been recommended quite extensively as a panacea to diversity inclusion concerns, but it is not one. In December 2020, unconscious bias training was scrapped for civil servants in England because ministers said it didn't work. The UK government followed the data, which says there's no ev evidence that it changes attitudes. And also urged other public sector employers to end this type of training. If only we could trust their motivation in finding so, and if only it had been replaced with something else like CQ. It's clear that realizing that unconscious bias exists, how it manifests itself, and the impact is important, but expecting people to be aware of their unconscious and mitigate it themselves is not actually possible. So take the recently updated academic paper by Forsha Lai et al. It aggregates into one 492 studies on the matter with nearly 90,000 participants. So it's properly academically robust. And it concluded that they found that implicit measures can be changed, but the effects are often relatively weak. Procedures changed explicit measures less consistently and to a smaller degree than implicit measures and generally produced trivial changes in behavior. They said their findings suggest that changes in implicit measures are possible, but these do not necessarily translate into changes in explicit measures or behaviors. So to explain that, even if weak changes in thinking did occur, they didn't mediate downstream to changes in behavior. And if they did, they were trivial in nature. So the recommendation from the author of that report was don't try to change your bias. Instead, focus on working around it. Target other intergroup outcomes and teach people to create, create procedural changes that prevent the influence of hidden bias, create procedural changes. When you add to that work that they did about unconscious bias, the work of Alexandra Kalev, who's a professor of sociology and anthropology at Tel Aviv University, she found that not only does bad training and one-off interventions not work, they can be counterproductive. So the target set to improve diversity and leadership can in fact be reversed. She found that efforts to get people to suppress their stereotypes can actually work to reinforce them. And often any positive change is weak and short term. She says that one theory is that if training tells us that we're all biased, we might no longer think that we need to make an effort or that making an effort will make any difference. Otherwise, a participant will come away with a sense of relief. They've been shown that their bias isn't their fault at all. The eagerness to label all bias as unconscious could allow us to evade the responsibility for the harm that it causes. 
And many businesses might see that unconscious bias uh, awareness training is a complete solution to their discrimination problems, a quick fix. But although unconscious bias training opens the door to fruitful conversations about bias, by itself, it won't make you or your company any less biased than you were before. Face-to-face -face online unconscious bias courses, whilst good at helping people realize that it exists, how it manifests itself, it doesn't focus enough about impact and it still expects people to mitigate themselves. And it makes no mention of the requirement of processes and structures that need to change in order to assist with mitigation. A report by the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, in the UK also points to uh, raising awareness being useful. And I said that already. It's part of the knowledge piece to open up the conversation. But evidence be for behaviour change is weak. And yet another report, a UK report, Diversity Management That Works Review, that found that while training around UB did increase awareness of issues such as unconscious bias, evidence of attitude and behavioural change among staff as a result of the training was less conclusive. Daniel Kahneman, who I call the father of heuristics, says it's extremely difficult to catch yourself doing something unconsciously. When asked why you made a decision, we'll convince ourselves of a valid reason when in reality our unconscious forced us to come to a conclusion based on our bias and shortcutting of information, a cerebral process of which we're completely unaware. And yet the conscious decision-making process, which we do control, is who we think we are. In fact, I'm going to quote from, from his book. He talks about, uh, so the book is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Thinking fast is that uh, 10 million 999,960 bits of information that you, your brain is pressing at any given moment. And thinking slow is the 40 bits of your consciousness that you're consciously thinking about. And he calls thinking fast your system one and thinking slow your system two. And this is what he says. He says the attentive system two is who we think we are. System two articulates judgments and makes choices, but it often endorses or rationalizes ideas and feelings that were generated by system one. You may not know that you're optimistic about a project because something about its leader reminds you of your beloved sister or that you dislike a person who looks vaguely like your dentist. If asked for an explanation, however, you will search your memory for presentable reasons and you will most certainly find some. Moreover, you will believe the story that you make up. Often we make mistakes because we, our system two, do not know any better. System one is indeed the origin of much of what we do wrong but it's also the origin of most of what we do right, which is most of what we do. Our thoughts and our actions are routinely guided by system one and are generally on the mark. However, it does not generate a warning signal when it becomes unreliable. There is no simple way for our system two to distinguish between a skilled, and a shortcut or biased response. Its only recourse is to slow down and to attempt to construct an answer on its own. In 2019, the Journal of Social Psychology published research. Psychologists showed people their own behaviors, but pretended that they were behaviors of some other person. When asked, participants reliably said they were less racist than the other person, even though that other person was in fact themselves. In January last year, the journal of Forensic Scientists uh, produced a paper, Cognitive Bias in Forensic Pathology Decisions. Forensic pathologists were more likely to rule homicide rather than accident for deaths of black children relative to white children, 
even when given identical medical information in Nevada. So you'd think that forensic pathologists who have just, you know, some, some card evidence in front of them would just stick to what they have in front of them. But no, that wasn't the case. Caroline Criado Perez in her book, Invisible Women, about the massive data gap that exists in our world around women because men are just seen as human norms representing all humans. Uh, she, she says this. Studies have shown that a belief in your own personal objectivity or a belief that you're not sexist makes you less objective and more likely to act in a sexist way. Men, women were not found to exhibit this bias, who believe their objective in hiring decisions are more likely to hire a male applicant than an identically described female applicant. A report after report shows the repeated suggestion that we can, simply by being aware, mitigate our own unconscious bias is not correct. We must stop saying that and teaching that. We need to put less store by one-off training interventions and more by the overall structures and processes that we need to create, implement and enforce to mitigate it. We must also put more effort into creating a culture of feedback where it's okay to call out each other's bias and mistakes because a diversity of staff can see it and feel it more clearly than we can ever do in ourselves. And for the recipient of that feedback, not to be defensive about it and to allow people who can see them and feel them to call out those issues and not vilify them for it. Bias is our biggest enemy when it comes to sustained and sustainable change. Now, how we move forward must always be cognizant of this. Even when you think you're doing well, we mustn't rest on our laurels because our very biological being is encouraging us to shortcut information, to make assumptions, even when we think we are not. And that's why it's so important to surround ourselves with a diversity of lived experiences and listen and act on those voices that are very different to our own. We have to break the cycle of our bias, supporting the systems which perpetuate in society, which reinforce our bias and very little changing, which can lead to diversity fatigue. And even as you listen to me now, that fatigue may be rearing its head. You know, you hear people saying, enough already. I've seen enough on the news about racism. I've heard enough about gender fluidity. I don't care anymore that women are raped on, or murdered when they're out on a run or that poor people can burn alive in their homes. No one can say that architecture doesn't hold some of the solutions to these issues. Does great architecture fatigue of these issues? Great architecture considers if we value life, all life in its richness, we place value on all life. And great architecture never looks at value purely in terms of pounds and pence. When we've done so, we've lost so many valuable gifts in our history, as well as our humanity. And doesn't great architecture brim with humanity? Thinking about the challenge of diversity and inclusion and the creating an inclusive culture in architecture is very much about these issues. And if this is the outcome, if, you know, the bias is, is, is the outcome. And if this kind of mitigation is what we need, what is the system that pushes us to think and act in this biased way in the first place? There's a very real and growing argument to suggest that capitalism as a system forces us to subjugate others. And if we understand diversity and inclusion in the context of just moving the pieces around the same board, then we will not succeed in EDI efforts in architecture. Effective EDI is about recognizing the systems that work to discriminate than attempting to subvert, subvert and dismantle them. The quote attributed to Einstein is, the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. 
I like to use his actual quote, which is problems can't be solved with the same level of consciousness that created them in the first place. That's far more useful a quote. In terms of thinking about EDI in architecture, this is where my paradigm underpinned with CQ comes in. Thinking about the challenge of EDI in architecture is very much about us creating workplaces that are utterly attuned and totally conscious of the systems around us that assume we can still function within them and create an equitable workplace and build an equitable society. Now, I think it's unnecessarily restrictive to think of managing business and economics purely in terms of binaries like capitalism and socialism. This is an unnecessary dichotomy. We all need to be cleverer than that. So how do we do this? CQ, cultural intelligence, Q stands for quotient because it's a measure as well as a skill. It's the capability to work and relate effectively with people who are different from you. And when applied properly, forces us to consciously and de deliberately challenge ourselves and the perspectives we're taking. It's an introspective piece of work that asks us to ask, what is it about me that needs to change so I can be more effective at working and relating with you? What is it about my business? What is it about my organization? What is it about my team that needs to change so we can be more effective at working and relating with you? So I'm going to share this one slide with you so that uh, I can explain a little bit more about the paradigm. So uh, I'm going to stop you sharing, if that's OK. So CQ is made up of four capabilities. The first is CQ drive. CQ drive is your persistence, your um, uh, willingness, your curiosity, your motivation to actually want to work and relate effectively with others. So do you want to? Do you actually want to work and relate effectively with others? So the first capability, CQ drive. The second is CQ knowledge. What do you know? What are you thinking about? What do you need to know uh, when working and relating with others? And because you can never know everything about everyone and know everything about everything, this is another reason why it's so important to surround yourself with the diversity of those lived experiences. Um, so it's not just about lived experiences and different values and norms. It's about different business systems, different languages, different leadership styles. So there's so much in CQ knowledge, you're always growing in that. And that's the second capability. The third is CQ strategy. And this is stopping to think about what you're thinking about. It's the metacognition piece. So if you're motivated and you have some knowledge and you go straight into action without stopping to check your assumptions, stopping to plan your interactions, stopping to think about your own self, your, what you're bringing to the party, your self-awareness, your organizational awareness, then you are going to act. You are going to um, do things in a very stereotypical and tokenistic way. So you need to stop to think. That is, that is the, what uh, Daniel Kahneman suggests in, in that uh, processing that you give to system two. And then finally, uh, the fourth capability is CQ action. Ultimately, we have to carry out the inclusive behaviors and someone who's high in CQ action has a broad repertoire of adaptable behaviors uh, because as Eisenhower says, the planning is everything, but the plan is nothing. So sometimes you have to throw the plan out the window and CQ action is about being adaptable in those circumstances. But that's not enough. Those are the, that's the foundational behavioral piece. But in order to bring about organizational change, we need uh, the four cornerstones of change, um, organizational change as identified by McKinsey in their influence model. And you need role modeling. And people are more likely to behave in a new inclusive way if they see their leaders and their colleagues behaving inclusively because people mimic individuals and groups and those who surround them consciously, sometimes unconsciously, but really, really important to see others behaving inclusively. You need to foster understanding conviction. And this is where people understand what's being asked of them. This is 
the data piece as well fits in here. Uh, people seek congruence between uh, their beliefs and actions. So understanding the why is very important. Developing talents and skills is about the training piece, but it's also about the opportunity to behave in new and inclusive ways. So we need things like um, objectives to, and in appraisals to have inclusivity built in and baked into that so that they have the opportunity to behave in new ways. And then supportive formal mechanisms. This is where you've got your recruit, recruitment, procurement, your policies are all written and built. And those are the procedural changes that help mitigate the impact of hidden bias. And when you uh, wrap this all up together and you implement it at individual team, departmental and organizational level from the top of your organization, across the four areas of the business, how you attract and educate people in architecture, how we retain and progress staff, how we create our products and services and reach out to our external stakeholders and our clients. Then we have an overall way of being able to share um, a, 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 an overall strategy to be able to um, bring about inclusive action. Did you see that video? You did, right? Yeah, cool. Uh, yes, we did, just to confirm that. <laughs> Thank you. Now, this intersectional approach is what I've implemented in other organizations. It's what I'm doing at the REBA and what I'm trying to do for architecture. Then we have a fighting chance of tackling the wider societal concerns that dog our lives. We need to lead with inclusion, which is the act, and manage diversity, which is the fact of visible and visible difference, to create equity, which is the impact. Every organization lives within our societies and we need momentum to create change. Now, I find this paradigm very easy to describe. I think it's straightforward for you to conceptualize. And I like to ask people to conceptualize it like a bag of sand because it's a holistic strategy to tackling EDI issues. But like a bag of sand, when you rip it open, it's a very granular, very detailed piece of work to do. So one grain might be a menopause policy. Another might be guidance around inclusive recruitment. Another might be a framework for inclusive design. And there's so much that needs to be done. The RIBA has got a role in supporting you, its members, to fulfill your commitments around EDI by sharing insight, support and guidance. And towards the end of last year, I used my 30 years of broadcasting experience alongside my expertise in EDI to run the radio station called Reba Radio. And on that radio station, we provided 28 hours of live content across a week on CQ, but also all aspects of EDI. So we can start to tackle those grains of sand by rooting it in that academically robust foundational behavioral principle of CQ. The podcasts of that live radio station are now available on Reba's SoundCloud channel and on Spotify via architecture.com and on Apple Podcasts. And if not already, and you want to see what you're listening to, the videos are available on Reba's YouTube channel on the Reba Radio playlist. Some of the highlights of that content include me speaking to Dr. David Livermore, who's a, who was the president of the Cultural Intelligence Centre. He's just stepped down, but he's still a co-founder there. He introduced us to CQ uh, as a framework through which we can strategically use our cultural differences to come up with innovative solutions. And he explained how this can be applied to architecture in the built environment. I spoke to Dr. Pragya Agrawal, behavioral and data scientist, consultant speaker and the author of this book, Sway. Uh, and she also wrote, We Wish We Knew What to Say, talking to children about race. And she explained the nature of bias and she explored how we can challenge it. Uh, I also spoke to, um, we had a really great, great discussion about uh, white uh, shame and discomfort. And that was featuring anti-racist consultant and clinical social worker Robin Schlenger. It also featured the architect Jim Rooney and the director of Open City, Phineas Harper. 
And we discuss ways in which defensiveness is a common reaction when dealing with all aspects of discrimination, especially racism and sexism and ableism. And the panel observed ways in which they have leaned into that discomfort, especially around white shame to move through it and to learn and to grow. Uh, we spoke to Zaymul Azad uh, of the Fawcett Society, uh, Annabel Suwemimu, who's a doctor and founder of Decolonizing Contraception, and Claire Nash um, of Claire Nash Architecture. And we explored the issues behind uh, the gender pay gap, uh, the assumptions to maintain it, the strategies to tackle it effectively, and during a really rich conversation about flexible work, improved accessibility, feedback me mechanisms were highlighted as priorities to ensuring autonomy at work for people with childcare com commitments. And we also talk about reproductive conditions, illnesses, all of these things uh, we covered. And that was just one conversation. We looked at socioeconomic backgrounds featuring Chris Hildry, Philip Watson of HLM, Karen Mosley of HLM. Um, we talked about how architecture is often seen as elitist due to expense and length of education perceived networks required to get ahead. Uh, we talked about LGBTQ plus experience. Uh, we talked about architecture education. Uh, we it brought in the future architects front to have that discussion. Really importantly, we spoke about decolonizing um, architecture. Uh, adaptations that work and different ways that we can look at um, uh, different schemes that are already at work. So lots and lots there. I always say the size of the task can seem scary, but we must each take personal responsibility for it because by changing our world, we can change the world. And when the size of the task becomes too much, Given it was Martin Luther King Day on Monday, I like to reflect on the words of Dr. King. He said, fly. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, you must keep moving forward. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I think I think my immediate reaction to that is just uh, oh, wow, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, the I think there's a lot there in it was a quite dense half an hour. If I, uh, <laughs> I think quite a few people are still kind of processing everything. Yeah. Um, I, I should be able to open it up for everyone now. Um, okay, I'll, I'll try that one. Great great um, topics and themes that came up and one that I was curious about in particular is uh, uh, you mentioned it a couple of times but that's enforcement so while you may have um, uh, a, an exit opportunity to educate people um, within the architectural profession um, particularly young people coming to universities uh, as well as um, you know directors uh, established directors of practices throughout the UK what a lot of people would um, look to is a level, uh, sort of assurances in, in enforcement capabilities. And one of the things you look at as you study architecture, um, particularly ahead of the part three, is the REBA Code of Conduct and Professional Standards, uh, the set of documentation. But I think most, if not everybody I've worked with, will have experienced and witnessed things that were and breach of many of those items are listed. But yet the, the kind of, um, the, the enforcement capabilities seem modest or, um, or surprisingly uh, ineffective. So you have, you have these cultures then that are developed where certain behaviors become normalized and people are um, uh, conditioned to, to accepting sub, sub uh, par behaviors. Can you tell us about, um, the ways in which REBA within itself as an, as an institution is going to be equipped or empowered to, to look at itself uh, and the mechanisms and infrastructures can put into place to ensuring that the teachings that are being done and the behaviours that are promoted are in fact uh, enforced? That is such a good question. Um, 
And when someone says, oh, that's such a good question, <laughs> you know that their response is going to be somewhat vague. Um, I obviously have been brought into this role. I'm, I'm not quite a year into the role yet. Um, to be able to try to affect and influence culture change. Uh, not only in, uh, you know, actually the staff at the RIBA ourselves, are, uh, my, my observation is that everyone is very much on board wanting to hold members, chartered practices and chartered members accountable for their actions when they don't come up to scratch uh, according to the code of conduct. Are those processes robust? My candid answer is probably not. And I'm working with the teams internally to, um, to try to improve those, to ensure that sanctions are you know, great, that we can work with the ARB alongside them because you know, having two separate processes are, you know, is, is, is problematic. Um, there are issues around how behaviours are instilled within architecture school as well. And at the moment, architecture schools, departments and courses don't themselves have a code of conduct uh, in order to be validated. So working with the education team on those. Um, so is there a proper whistleblowing process as well? So people can actually say, I've witnessed these behaviours without feeling they have to um, you know, compromise their career in doing so. Um, I think there are a lot of cards stacked against those speaking up. So there's a lot of work to do, Paul, in terms of actually getting to the outcomes where, you know, sanctions are, or people come up, come forward. Uh, they feel that they can, they can do so safely, but also that when they do say so, something will happen uh, that's useful as a result. Uh, consequences that members and practices don't want but um that's a bit of a stick in terms of carrot um uh, more and more talented people are coming out uh the you know education only wanting to work in places that are not only uh hiring uh, diverse teams but um inclusive cultures and so it's my intention, what I can do is create uh, in what I'm calling inclusion charter competencies. So uh, back in November 2020, um, the RIBA launched inclusion charter and many members and practices signed up to that. But that was a, a list of commitments that we needed to actually provide guidance around, which is what the reboot radio work was was about. But also want to be able to help people demonstrate certain competencies and reach certain levels of competency so that people coming into the profession can look at a particular practice and say, oh, they've reached a level of inclusion competency. I'm going to go and work there because I know that they're going to hold themselves accountable for diverse environments and inclusive environments. So um, that's more of the carrot work that I can control and, um, and try to deliver. Thank you for that, Paul. Um, I think one thing that occurs to me is is the the um, the incoming kind of uh, uh, mandatory competencies, and the so far we've had the kind of fire, health, and safety uh, in kind of as in that. My understanding is that has already been worked on, and what as a result of recent events was accelerated. Um, and down the line, there's the next one, I believe, is the sustainability one. And after that is going to be a, an ethics one. Do you see this work in terms of in cultural intelligence kind of folding into that ethics? Yes. Kind of mandatory competency. And that's that's where some of this will sit in terms of personnel, uh, as well as the practice being able to um, kind of uh, demonstrate that that uh, standard, as you described earlier. Yes. And I think. Um... Uh, we are I'm working with with the CPD teams to uh, to create suitable um, CPD uh, or so people can keep keep up their competencies um, uh, as, as well as given that I described that inclusion actually needs to be baked into all parts of an organization. So it's not just how you create your products and services, but it's how you're treating your staff. It's how you're 
doing the recruitment it's uh, how you're uh, speaking to clients that it needs to be at, at, at every stage that we're providing the right kind of guidance so that you can feel that as a member you're getting the competence support that you need um so yes is the short answer working with the team to to help provide that glad to hear it um do we have any questions from the rest of the the group um or comments even? yes uh, if i can <laughs> yep, well, uh, and I'm trying to I, I, I unmute myself. It's okay. <laughs> uh, hi, Marcia. This is hi. a really captivating talk because I'm telling you I'm uh, working as a senior lecturer at the University of Derby in architecture design programs. Uh, and uh, in the last few years, I saw that uh, from my own knowledge around the university, the only thing we had. Uh, to start working with uh, the themes you uh, you talk about education, especially it was a, a race equality group of volunteers being there, trying to grab colleagues and you know and uh, students and discuss. Because I think, to my knowledge, it should be done a bit better if we give more voice to students in education and especially for things of inclusivity to talk clearly honestly about issues and problems so in the last let's say few months we started also moving in our school of government with a, a, an edi um, steering group but i want to see more participation of students in there not only staff you know because mm. it might be a bit little biased the whole discussion the only thing that i'm thinking that it, it, you mentioned also is not only decolonizing the um the profession is decolonizing the curriculum first and the yes. curriculum and yeah, we yeah. started there thinking about making a bit more somehow not actually looking at the reading list at first and all these things so do you think that um, the participation also of the students should be more proactive in this kind of educational models of really eradicating this kind of uh, culture that it, it has been for so many years. And now we are moving towards something different. And um, my, my understanding is that we need our students supporting us when we start this kind of initiatives anyway. Do you think so? Um, I think whatever you're planning, uh, whatever you're doing, always have a, a variety of voices. And, and who, who are the stakeholders? Well, it is the students. And so um, when you're, uh, you absolutely need to have students in, involved um, in, in all of that um, to, to ensure that you're approaching it in the way that's going to be most effective for them. Uh, as well as 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 well as for you as a staff, I've just put in the chat a link to Reba Radio. Um, I do recommend you listen to all the um, uh, uh, content, but um, it's episode. Um, well, episode 18 is about architecture education anyway, um, but then episode 22 is about decolonization. And we invited two students from decolonized architecture who actually students at University of Bath. Um, who are part, who've created this network of, of um, students looking at the architecture uh, um, curricula uh, to see how and, and to explore ways and to highlight issues around decolonization as well. So um, you might find those useful to, to have a listen to um, and uh, might help inform some of your discussions. Uh, thank you so much, Marcia. Really, I enjoyed that. And thank you for the links as well, because I want to share with my colleagues and students, especially, to, to see what better could be done. I think all educators nowadays, we are trying hard for that, because we find it difficult, and especially being a woman also in education, you know, <laughs> you have a male environment. In this environment. Well, no. actually... Uh Eleni also listened to uh, the Working Outside London, which was episode 19, because we had um, Elena Marco on there. 
she's okay. Bath, I think University of West England, I think, and Sue M. So that was that would be a really good one as well about talking about being outside London and women. Actually, they were all women on that panel, funnily enough. Anyway, there's loads. Listen to it all because it's all okay, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do that because it is a great reality. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe doing some sessions with the students when I do personal tutoring. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So that's what it's there for. Yeah, so, yeah. That yeah. would be great. Really. Thank Good. you so much. You're Thank welcome. You. Paul's put his hand up. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about any of the uh, data gathering uh, methodologies that might be uh, going on and, and kind of some of the empirical information that comes out about the cases and what the landscape generally looks like from that point of view. Yeah. So, uh, I thank you for asking the question. Um, data is a really, really useful tool to help inform how we target our work and to monitor and track change. I don't like to use data to drive change because we just need to look out the window to see that it's raining, do you know what I mean? Uh, we, don't need a, we don't need a report by Sue Gray to tell us. <laughs> um, and so um, we are looking at data at the moment to see how can we collect data in a really meaningful way across the sector. And that's a piece of work that I'm looking to do this year, um, because at the moment, um, different departments within the RIBA, the RIBA and ARB, uh, the uh, RIBA and schools, we all collect different amounts of data to different depth. So I want to try to create some kind of standardization. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing around sort of uh, disproportionality, if you like, um, the actual statistic for the UK population. Uh, well, let me ask you this question, actually. What, unless you've heard me say this before, um, what percentage of the UK population is white, male, heteronormative, uh, able-bodied and based in London and the Southeast? So what proportion of the UK population do you think uh, is white, male, able-bodied, heterosexual and based in London, Southeast? Give me a shout out, a percentage. I've no idea, but I, would it be a minority group? Relative yeah. To the UK? Yeah. What? 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 What would you? What percentage? I mean, minorities anything under fifty percent? So you're, you, you're explicitly talking about kind of the southeast as an area, right? Yeah. Than, yeah. So I think within that area, I would guess at, at least at least seventy five, given that it's got London as well. Uh, the, what, what's the, what what percentage of the UK population fulfills uh, those? The yeah, UK, yeah. Uh, oh, I guess two percent. Two percent, yeah. Maybe ten percent. Ten percent. Any advance on that from Jacqueline or Eleni? Ten percent. Ten percent. Yeah. So, so Paul was was close. It's three point one percent of the UK population are white, male, able-bodied, heterosexual men based in London Southeast. And when you look at who runs architecture, mm -hmm. uh, who's responsible for businesses, who's responsible for the work, who's responsible for uh, income, uh, you can already see this major disproportionality there. Um, I mean, 70, I think it's more than 70% of income around uh, architecture comes from London Southeast. Um, and 80% of uh, chartered architects are um, uh, white men. Um, so it's like, the, it's just, you know, gives new meaning to the term uh, sort of a minority group really. And certainly underrepresentation um, is across the board. If you're not part of that, those groups, if you're not white, male, able-bodied, heterosexual, man based in London, Southeast, you're, 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 you're in the minority, uh, you're underrepresented in the profession. And so, um, uh, the, so everything needs to be tackled in terms of what are the systems and structures that allow this status quo and how do we dismantle them so that we can become a more equitable society? Uh, that's a given. 
uh, so it's more a case of, well, where do we channel our efforts? Um, and that's what the data I hope will show us and, and standardizing it across, across the piece will help us get there. Yeah. Um, presumably, that those those people you're discussing with the um, that data, are you, are you looking at um, the section for architectural workers as well? So it's my. I I, I would love to do a far-reaching survey and census, which includes all aspects of architecture, um, mm. the architecture profession, not just architects, and the built environment potentially as well. But not just yet. <laughs> well, no, I just need money, and I need, <laughs> I, I need, I, I need people. I need all. I, I need ARB on board. I need the other institutes on board. I need the schools on board. So, it's, I would love to achieve it this year. I would love to achieve that this year. Yeah. Have you um, have you had much interaction, or or I, I suppose you you've not been doing this within. Uh, correct, well, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but within architecture for that long, only only a, a year, as you say, have you had much correspondence or interaction with with international groups uh, of the kind of um, the RIB or ARB um, kind of uh, uh, comparable bodies in Europe, for example? Uh, not in Europe. I've met I met. Um... Peter Exley of the AIA, who's just the outgoing president. Right. Um, uh, but that's the only one. And I have, because I'm on my own in terms of the expertise in the uh, in the profession right now, um, I have to prioritise domestic uh, yeah. endeavours, especially because, you know, in France, you can't ask about faith, for example. So getting data and getting um uh you know an understanding of where other countries are is uh is, is tricky anyway so um there's enough work to do at home <laughs> yeah no doubt um yeah okay um any any final comments or questions from anyone else um if not uh, I, I think we'll We'll call it there for the evening, if that's that's all right with everyone. Um, uh, yeah, I think again, just to reiterate, uh, a fascinating um, presentation. Thank you for that, and thank you for your time, Marsha. Um, and I will continue working my way through the uh, the, the podcasts. Um, it would be great uh, for, in terms of for the website, to have a, a, a list of the, the books you referenced. And, and the, oh yes, I've got a, I've got a, a sheet ready for that. Actually, I'll send that to you. No problem. That would be great. Email it across. You can add on, you know, just kind of accessible links to for people who want to to follow. Threads. Delve in, <laughs> read your prag your agarwal. Yes, 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 definitely. Um, yeah. Okay then. Well, thank you very much again, and. Okay. Look forward to uh, to seeing you in in person, perhaps uh, yeah, later. Uh, and thank you, everyone else, for for being able to join us this evening.